Hey guys, so today is gonna to be just a little bit different. Um, I'm actually decided to take some time to sit down in front of the camera and talk to you guys one-on-one -on -one here. It's not something I typically do, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to share some of the processes that go into making wildlife film, at least that I have learned, that make it a little easier for me to make films. And if there's something you can learn from it that I can share that can help you get out there and make new films yourselves, would love that. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in learning the process, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. Um, there's gonna be many more videos like this here where I sit down and tell you a little bit more about my process or different little tricks and tips behind the scenes, uh, along with actual like footage of, you know, getting out there and making films itself, um, some of what I've already done. So it'd be fun to have you guys join me on this journey. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions that you'd like to have me answer, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below. I would love to take some time, answer those questions directly, and who knows, maybe I'll make a film about that in the future. So yeah, anyways, let's get into this video. And this is my world now. My name is Alan Lacey, and I'm a wildlife filmmaker, cameraman, and producer. Adventure with me as I explore the amazing world of nature and show you what it's like filming a wild. All right, guys, yes, so today's, like I said, it's gonna be different. I'm gonna kind of jump into explaining my process of making wildlife films. I'm actually here in Arizona right now. I'm, um, this is at my parents' house, um, but I'm filming a story on the biodiversity of the Sonoran Desert. I grew up here, so it's kind of home for me, but um, just kind of getting out to tell people the story of when you get out into the desert, you know, if you open your eyes and your ears, how alive the desert truly is. So I'm gonna kind of share some of the process about how I'm gonna go make this film. Anyways, I've got several shoots coming up in the next couple of months that's going to demand some of my time. So I wanted to kind of get some of these videos out. Anyways, let's just dive right into this stuff, shall we? All right, just some coffee first though. You know, can never go wrong with that. Okay, all right. So one of the first things, you know, that I wanna kind of just get out there now, there, this is not a, a set in stone process. These are things that I've learned along the journey, along the way in my journey of wildlife filmmaking that I would love to share and help. Hopefully some of these tips can give you guys a head start into making your own films. One of the most important things in making a wildlife film is really concentrating on your story. Story is incredibly important. Story is everything. So really focus on finding that story that you want to tell. So I can tell people that story is everything, but along with story, is your audience, really making sure that your story can actually be heard by the audience you are intending your film to reach. So those kind of two things really go in tandem with each other. All right, so my seven steps of what it takes to actually get out and make a film kind of comes down to these basic things. They are research, planning, fundraising, scheduling, production, post-production, and distribution. Making sure that as you look at all these different steps, keeping story and your audience as those key driving factors as you create these elements, extremely important. Oh man, it's so good. All right, so one of the things that I like to do when I'm making a film is kind of stay organized with all of the different steps. So I actually use Google Documents. Um, Google Docs is a huge lifesaver. You can create obviously documents, but spreadsheets, um, concept boards, um, you know, even like if you want to use different types of little apps connected to Google Drive to kind of create storyboards. You can do that too, it's phenomenal. Main things I use are docs and sheets for budgeting and stuff. First step that I like to do is the research phase. Again, story being an incredibly important part. First of all, you gotta figure out what your story is. So you gotta think about things that um, would be, you know, one, the scope of what you're trying to tell. Um, is it feasible? Like, is it something that you're gonna film in your backyard that only requires you, your camera? Or is this, a, is this a major production that's gonna require a lot of funding, a lot of time and resources? Maybe you have to do the story in like Indonesia or something, and you've gotta hire a crew and, and arrange travel arrangements, visas for filming, all kinds of stuff that goes into that. So the scope is an important part, and is it feasible? I really would you know, suggest if you're starting out, do something in your backyard. Um, another thing would be looking at the different characters that you wanna um, explore. So whether or not the character is the actual animal itself, or perhaps you wanna tell a conservation story with a biologist or a researcher who's very charismatic that will kind of drive your story. So doing the research to figure out how are you gonna tell this story? Where are you gonna tell this story? Who's gonna be the people involved? 
All right, is this going to live on online? Is this going to be a, a story for um, a broadcast? Are these people that love hummingbirds and you're making a, a film about uh, hummingbirds? I mean, those are things to consider. So really, really kind of key in on who your audience is going to be for. So for example, I'm doing all this stuff for, for YouTube. So it's for people like you who are come across this video and are interested in learning more about wildlife films. You are the audience that I am targeting with this actual film. So um, keep in mind that audience. All right, so one of the next big things is planning. All right, so once you've kind of gone through and you've kind of done your research, you know what your story is gonna be about. The next thing is to really just sit down and plan it out. So this is where you kind of create storyboards, your scripts, you look at the, the entire scope of the film and you figure out, okay, what's this gonna cost me? Is this something I'm doing in my backyard? Maybe it doesn't cost anything more than your own time. Or, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's something that's a little bit more involved where you actually have to sit down and kind of create a budget and put all the pieces together and figure out your travel costs, your lodging, et cetera. And um, that's part of the planning phase. Uh, then also like figuring out well, those characters you did in your research phase this is actually where you re reach out to them. You would try to initiate that contact, get a relationship going. It's really important to kind of develop relationships um, and then see if you can get them to confirm to being involved in your story. Sometimes it's, if, especially if you have a budget you're working with, it's, it's kind of common courtesy to, to pay them for their time that they're gonna be involved in your film. Um, sometimes you can get people to, to donate their time as well, especially if you're really working on a shoestring budget. That's kind of where I have lived in the last few years. So um, if you have a budget to, to pay your characters, that is definitely something you should do. Um, once you've kind of got your characters selected, one important thing is to kind of make sure your location where you're going to film. If you have the time to get out there and do a location scout and really kind of see what it looks like, how you're going to use your cameras, how are you going to get the story filmed. If you don't have the time to go actually go out and do a scout, um, just kind of show up a little bit early, get yourself situated and kind of figure out which hotels you might want to use or um, where you're actually going to be going. If a fee is involved in getting a permit, getting that kind of stuff set up ahead of time during the planning stage is important. Um, also lining up the right equipment and the right personnel on your shoot. If it's just you, it's pretty simple to do that. However, if you're going to involve a larger crew where you're going to have like hired cameramen out there, producers and directors, etc., cetera, um, coordinating their schedules to be able to get them on location during the dates that you want to actually go about filming your story, obviously are an important element to do. And kind of one of the last things you do is once you kind of get this all kind of together and you have your story, you have your storyboard, perhaps you have a script order kind of sort of outlined. It's important to kind of have those those pieces in place. And that would be creating a shot list. So what is your, what shots do you need in your film? So are you looking for, you know, real tight close up shots of animals and really showcasing the detail, some wider um, shots to really expose the scenery and show where the, env the environment, the habitat that these animals live in. Really think through the uh, story and the visuals that you want your film to capture. So shot list is really where you kind of get into that creative and really get into the nitty gritty as well of really focusing on what shots you need to tell your story. And then I think one of the hardest things is uh, process or step number three and that's fundraising. Um, I do all of my films pretty much through um, getting crowdfunded and then going out and producing the film. It's extremely hard. My hat goes off to anyone who tries to fundraise their own films because it is extremely challenging. Um, but funding is an important part, obviously. So once you've kind of got your film planned, you know the budget, you know what it's going to involve and what's it going to take to actually make this film, it's going to cost something. So figuring what that is and how you're going to go out and get that fund, that money, that funding is an important step. So. What I've done in the past is use places like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, great little platforms, especially if you're looking at raising just small little amounts. If you're raising money for a larger film, it can be a little more challenging, it certainly requires a lot more effort. I have failed so many times on crowdfunding, I can't even count. Um, but I've had a couple successes as well, which has really propelled some of my films to really have the ability to be produced, which was amazing, but it took quite a bit to get to. But you have to push through, you have to make it work. Um, if it's something you're all passionate about, where there's a will, there's a way. So you really have to focus on, you know, if this is a story you want to tell, just go out and make it happen. Friends, family, Kickstarters. Um, sometimes you can do, uh, if you have 
people that are looking at investing, I don't really recommend this for like wildlife documentaries because you typically don't make any money on them. Um, so, but in the normal world of filmmaking, you can get investors to invest into your film. And then the, with, the, with the hope of that, once you get your film sold to a, a production company or a distribution company of some sort, whether it's like Netflix or something, that the money you make on those sales, what you could then pay your investors plus the interest. So um, not really highly recommended, for, uh, at least in, the, in my experience, but if you have a way to make that work, by all means, go for it. But for myself, I've, I've found that uh, pretty much just using from a uh, Kickstarter, raising the funds yourself, it seems to be the best place for me, at least in this, that I've discovered for, for making films. So it's, but it's an important part. It's like funding is so key because you got to be able to pay your crew and be able to pay all the different places you're going to be filming at. So after you've raised your funds and you've got everything in the bank, you know the story, you've done your research, you've kind of planned it out, you've got your budgets, you've got your funding, now it's time to actually go about scheduling. A lot of people don't really look at this, but I consider it a step because you really have to really focus on being able to make it all work, right? So getting your crew set up, getting your location set up, making sure dates and times and all that coordinate for all elements and making sure everybody's on the same page, super important. I actually create um, kind of like a, a year's calendar of uh, for each film. And then I put my crew in there and I figure out uh, the locations. I can show you this on, on the screen here in just a second. Um, and that really showcases how I go about putting the schedules together. Um, so that's, a, that's an important thing. The coordination of that is important. This is where it's fun. This is where I enjoy it the most. Um, so we'll be right back after this brief coffee message. It's like my lifeblood. So production. Um, this is the part where you've done all of this pre-work and now you've gotten to the actual thing. So it's like, show me the money, let's make it work. Um, and this is where you follow all of your shot lists. You've created and you've spent the time to create your story and all your shot lists. This is the time where you sit down and you actually capture the footage. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory when you think about it in terms of production, but there's a few things um, in the whole production process that I have found that make things a little bit easier. Um, one is obviously choosing the right crew and the right people to work with. Um, you don't want to work with people who are always at your throats or you're always button heads with things on. Um, if you're the producer on the show, you want to be able to work with people who are experienced like you are. And if you're not experienced, people who are aware of that and they can sit there and they can also kind of like coach and mentor you. So making sure everybody is fully aware of where, your, where everybody's skill levels are is important. Um, uh, and then really being able to just have fun. Um, it's all about getting out and being creative. So being able to get those creative juices flowing is an important element. So making sure you have good place to sleep, getting good rest as best as possible. Sometimes that's impossible, especially if the subjects you're wanting to film. I've been doing a story on burrowing owls, for example. Um, so they are nocturnal. Well, they're kind of iron. They're all over the place with terms of being awake. But you know, in the evening hours, they come alive. So you're filming in the late evening. We've been doing some infrared as well. So I'm filming in the into the early night up towards midnight. And then we're going back to bed, offloading our media, getting everything set up. Then come early morning, we're back at it again at like, you know, the sunrise. So, and then we sleep during the day, <laughs> just kind of like the owls. Um, so it's doing whatever you can to try to get yourself and be kind to your body. It'll allow you to be a much better, more effective person out when you're on these shoots. But sometimes it's, it is kind of hard sometimes. Um, and then once you've captured all your footage for the day, one of the most important things is actually the review. So um, after each little shot, whether it's the morning or evening or whatever the, the case is, when you get back to the place where you're going to download your media, uh, download it, put onto your different, you obviously want to back it up twice. That way in case something happens to one copy, you have it on the other. Um, and then review that footage. Look through it, see if um, if you've been able to nail your shots, because sometimes you think you have a really good shot and you're, you've focused on things just right, but then when you look at it, <laughs> sometimes you miss your focus or you miss your shot. So it's always important to review your footage in case you have to go back out and try to get through that footage again. Um, so now obviously wildlife doesn't always do the same thing twice, but at least you know, hey, we thought we had this in the bag, but maybe we didn't sell something to look for. So that kind of thing is important. Um, and then I kind of touched on a little bit ago when you want to have um, two copies of your media together. It's important what I consider media managed. So really figuring out a way to 
um, really organize the media that you have, um, especially when you go into a larger production where you have multiple cameras and multiple different media sources, being able to organize it all in a way that when you get into your post-production for your editing, you have a way to actually understand what it is that you filmed and how it was um, in a timeline. I always date it, I always um, organize it by camera, by, by shoot, by location. Um, so it's really important to have a very good organized system so that when you get into the edit, the editor, or if it's yourself, or if you hire somebody else, if it's not you, can actually go through your footage and understand it in a way that uh, makes sense. Um, so that's an important thing. So, and I think that's kind of the main things for uh, being on location when you're producing. Obviously you want to be able to kind of really, again, I can't stress it enough, focus on your story. Really think about as you're filming, how this relates to your story. How does it fit into the story? What is, how does it weave into the narrative and how your audience is gonna uh, react to it as well too. So those are real important. Just always keep in mind your, your uh, story and your audience pretty much in every phase of production. All right, and so the next step is post-production. Now post-production is kind of where all the magic happens. You've spent the time out producing it, getting all the footage you need. Um, this is where it kind of, for some people, it kind of gets into the nitty gritty. Um, people either love it or hate it. And that's like diving into actually editing the program. Um, it's a lot of work. So if you have a small program, it's a short film, it's not quite as time intensive, though they still can somewhat be time intensive. Sometimes short films can be the hardest films to put together because you really got a short period of time with a, with a dynamic story to weave into it and you've only got so much time to do it. So you have to really be selective. Um, but it's one of the most fun, one of the most challenging parts of making a film. So again, what I was talking about in the production side, when you've gone through and you've kind of organized your, your, all of your different media and you've kind of got it set up, this is where it really translates well into post-production because now you can go in and go into each day and what I like to do um, is go into every different uh, day's worth of footage and create what we call selects. Now these selects are just the small little parts of the whole clip that you've put together or you filmed and you are selecting the best of the best. So you're looking through all your footage and finding the pieces that you want to be able to really key in on and focus for putting your film together. So like if you've been filming a bunch of wildlife behavior, um, let's say you've been filming wolves in Yellowstone and you have tons and tons and tons of behavior. Some of it can get monotonous and kind of repetitive, so you may not need all of that. So you just look through and go, okay, between this start point and this end point, here is a very interesting behavior that took place. Maybe a wolf um, like did something to another one that was just really interesting. So you could cut and move that piece and put it up above on the timeline just to create what we call the select. And you can move that into its own folder if you want, however you want to be able to work with it. Um, I actually keep it all on the same timeline linearly. I just make my cuts in the middle of where I want to, which specific part I want to use as a select. And then I actually, on the different tracks, I just pull that one up above on the second track above. But I know all the ones on the second track are all my selects for that day. Um, and it's kind of important to do that um, some people do that during their production side. So when they've gotten done filming for the day, they just go ahead and pull selects at the end of the day. That actually can save a lot of time if you have the time to do that. Um, but if you don't, getting that done before you actually jump into the edit and post-production is important. So yeah, creating selects, getting all your footage organized. Um, then once you've kind of put all those selects together, now is when you can jump in and start creating the different sequences. So you can jump in, look at your story. Again, story being so critical look at that story, find the different pieces that fit to telling that story. The pieces that you've put together in your shot list, in your script, in your storyboard. Now you can find those selects to match and put into little sequences for each little story element within your story. And then once you've put all those pieces together, you can assemble it all into what we call the rough cut. And then the rough cut is just basically what it sounds like. You've cut all the pieces together very roughly and it's kind of just this crude little outline of what your story looks like. And from there, you just keep refining, refining, really tightening up your transitions, really tightening up your story and really focusing on getting your message in your film out there as, as efficiently as possible. Um, often people uh, love the beginning. They love jumping into the footage of just getting in there, starting to get the selects, putting the story together. 
and then it starts getting monotonous and then it really um, it can really drive you down to where you're like this just looks terrible i don't like it anymore this is about in the middle of the edit where you're just like kind of hating it all and then all at some point it all of a sudden turns and you're like start thinking to yourself actually this is looking pretty good i'm actually kind of proud of this it starts looking better and by the end you're just really excited about it it's kind of the stages of an edit you just be used to that um when you get that final cut then you gotta worry about getting all your mastering, getting all the audio, putting all the audio pieces together, if you're getting music, if you're doing narration, um, kind of mix and mastering all the natural sound, putting all those pieces into place um, once you've kind of got that final, what we call picture lock, where, you have, where you're making no more edits to the actual timing of the video. Everything's set in stone, you like it. Now you're just adding all the audio levels and layers into creating that atmosphere for the film. Um, so that's an important part is really kind of getting it down. If you've got graphics, putting the graphics in at that point, your text, um, any, any credits at the end, um, then you have to colorize it, um, color correct it first and then colorize it. If there's gonna be a color, um, specific coloring that you want for the film to have this certain look to it. Um, color grading is what they call it. Um, if you're like me, you're colorblind. <laughs> that's a really challenge. I actually usually have that, someone else do that for me. Um, so those are real important things in the post-production side of it that you really want to focus on. And again, always be sure when you create your budget to make sure you incorporate the various elements of post-production. And I'm thinking what I might do is at some point kind of dive into each one of these seven elements and maybe make a video on each one of them so we can really kind of focus on how this all works. So anyways, yeah, so that's, uh, that's production or post-production. And now we're going to get on to the next and final stage. All right, so moving on to step number seven, the final one is distribution. And this is one where when I made my first film, I didn't even think about the process of distribution. And um, I was so focused on getting my film out there, getting it out to the world, which you know, in a sense it's distribution, but the actual understanding of what's involved in getting it out to the world was a whole nother concept. So for people who make films, I'd say I hope this is helpful to you because when you make a film, again, it comes to your audience and your story. Where are they going to see your film? Where is this film going to live? Um, right here for this channel, for Filming the Wild, everything's on YouTube, everything's free. It's for people who are interested in wildlife, photography, filmmaking. So those people can come check out this channel and see it. That's my audience, that's where it lives. Um, for some of my other films, um, like we've been in talks with various production companies about getting it to live on their networks. Um, or production companies, broadcast entities, I mean, to get them to live on their networks. Um, there's also a, quite a few different places online where you can have your film live, whether it's like Vimeo, YouTube, um, if you can get lucky enough to get it on a place like Netflix, these kind of ideas really are things you need to think about and where your film is going to go. So I highly recommend uh, as you're putting your film together, Always kind of in the back of your head, keep in, keep in mind the distribution, where it possibly could go. And that's where, again, your audience is so key. Um, one really cool thing you can do with distribution um, is getting your film into film festivals. Film festivals are great ways to get your film out there. Um, just kind of seeing how people react. You spent all this time working on it, producing it, um, getting it edited in your post-production. Um, and then now it's time to actually get the film seen. You can see how the people react to it. So that's um, a really cool place you can take it thanks to is your distribution film festivals. Um, and sometimes distributors come to film festivals and are looking for films to acquire. So you might just get lucky and uh, be able to get your film sold to somebody um, who's looking for the content that you've produced. Um, so always a great place is film festivals. Um, another place to look is distribution companies. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Just all you have to do is go online and look up for distribution companies for film and see if they have uh, interest in like documentaries or natural history. Uh, so really kind of looking into that. There's a bunch of them, especially in uh, the UK and in Europe as well, as, as well as here in the US, but um, really good place to look into there. There's quite a few different options. Um, and then kind of you just got to think, are you, if you're going to try to self-distribute, are you going to get it out there for free, like what I'm doing here at YouTube? Um, or is it something that people are going to pay per view? So you can, there's several different streaming platforms, Vimeo being one, even YouTube, you can, 
you can, uh, uh, once you've got your film situated to a certain point of having enough subscribers and stuff, you can actually monetize your channel, monetize your videos. Um, and sell them. Um, so those those are maybe ways of making a little bit of money back. I've discovered um, I haven't made a whole lot of money on my films in the past. So um, online is a good way, but you know it just depends on how well you're able to market it and getting it really out there for the world to see. So those are kind of the basic steps of putting together a wildlife film. Hope you've liked it. Um, by no means is this like the sure way to go about and make a film. Um, so I just my biggest recommendation is just to get out there, start creating. If these have been helpful, you can start putting those processes into place. You know, think about uh, all the research you got to do, the planning, the fundraising, the production, the post-production, you know, the distribution, all the different things that actually get into it, the scheduling. Um, really, those are all the most important parts of making a wildlife documentary. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. I know it's a lot to talk about and I probably talked a little bit too fast, to be honest. Again, I'm not really that familiar from getting in front of a camera and talking one-on-one, -on -one, so I kind of tend to rush things, so apologies there. But hopefully some of these tips um, will help you in your process to learning how to make a wildlife film and documentary yourself. Um, it's been a lot of fun in my journey to do it, so I just, anything I can give back to help someone else jump into this industry as well is something I'm really passionate about. So if you're watching this and you're wanting to become a wildlife filmmaker, you know, take whatever you can to heart, learn on your own. It's a lot of trial and error. Just get out there, have fun and make films. Um, and again, if you haven't done so already, please like this video, subscribe, um, leave a comment in the comment section below. Leave me a question if you have, after learning more things maybe that you'd like some more um, questions answered. Drop that comment in the comment section below. Would love to uh, do whatever I can to help you guys on your journey. So anyways, thanks for watching this and uh, we'll stay tuned for the next one. I'm probably gonna be out in the field next time with a story on the Sonoran Desert, so keep an eye out for that. Anyways, till next time, keep another eye out for Filming the Wild.